will move quickly on now to um, Nancy Ann. She, of course, needs no introduction because she is the co-chair of this amazing symposium. So thank you for that, Nancy Ann, again. Um, but she is also the uh, director of the Division of Clinical um, Neuro-Oncology. So I'm very happy that she's going to share with us the management of high-grade glioma. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to quickly actually go through management of high-grade glioma, really just bread and butter today. I'm going to leave the more exciting clinical trials and precision medicine to my colleagues, but just kind of telling everyone how we treat high-grade glioma standard of care, which admittedly is not as exciting as the low-grade glioma, which has much more nuances per patient. No disclosures today. And again, I'm going to just review the exciting changes the WHO is coming out in 2021 review standard of care management for our high-grade tumors, a little bit on the management of pseudoprogression, and then what we also do is kind of standard of care for our IDH wild type tumors when we don't have clinical trial options. So first, for anyone that missed Dr. Perry's amazing talk this morning, <clears throat> there are some very exciting changes that are coming down the pipeline for the WHO 2021 edition. Uh, glioblastoma is only going to be used for IDH wild type tumors. There's no more IDH mutant GBM. And it must include um, an IDH wild type as well as one or more of the necrosis, microvascular proliferation, TERP promoter mutation, EGFR amplification, or chromosome copy changes in seven and 10. Astrocytomas lacking the IDH mutation are now just called GBM. There's no more molecular GBM, so to speak. So what about those patients that are high grade that have the IDH mutation? So IDH mutant tumors are now gonna be classified as either grade two, grade three, or grade four. Uh, we're not gonna use the word anaplastic anymore. And IDH mutant grade four astrocytoma is a high grade tumor. It has to have one, the IDH one or two mutation, as well as uh, one of the following, microvascular proliferation, necrosis, or specifically CBKN2A2B homozygous deletion. And then finally, the diffuse midline gliomas, H3K27 mutants, or H3 G34Rs, or grade four tumors. Uh, this is going to be discussed by my colleague, Dr. Schulte, in a bit. So the reason why I love neuro-oncology, it is so multidisciplinary. We have our radiologists, our surgeons, our neuro-oncologists, our pathologists, and our radiation oncologists working together to create the best treatment regimen for every single patient. We do it from the moment they're diagnosed, through their treatments, MRI surveillance, to recurrence, and we do it all again. So it really is a multidisciplinary approach. And we've heard about many of that this morning already. So today I'm just focusing on the chemotherapy part, which is really quite standard. So we follow the STU protocol. We do six weeks of concurrent daily temozolomide at 75 milligrams per meter squared with radiation, seven days a week. They don't get the breaks for the weekend like the uh, radiation gives them. Followed by adjuvant temozolomide, given double the dose at 150 to 200 milligrams per meter squared, for six to 12 months and the five days on, 23 days off cycles. Temozolomide is an oral cytotoxic DNA alkylating agent. And we know through the Stoop protocol and this classic paper that he published um, back in 2005, that the addition of temozolomide to radiation improved overall survival of patients on the order of about two months from 12 months to 14.6 months. However, it doubled the two-year survival rate from 10% to 26%. So yes, we give temozolomide with radiation based on this. Now, what about MGMT? We always hear a lot about that. MGMT is O6-methylguanine DNA methyltransferase. It is a DNA repair gene. It takes methyl groups from guanine and it puts it back on itself. So how I explain it to patients is our chemotherapy works by breaking DNA. MGMT, when it's active, comes along and fixes that damage. The chemotherapy doesn't work quite as well. MGMT is in its inactive state when it's methylated. So patients who have MGMT methylation have a better response to chemotherapy. And we see that uh, from this classic paper from Monica Heggie showing that patients who have MGMT methylation have the best overall survival with patients with uh, glioblastoma. And so patients up on the top here are those that had MGMT methylation in addition to radiation and temozolomide. The patients that did the worst were patients who were unmethylated that had radiation only. So this is a question we get asked all the time. What about our MGMT unmethylated patients? Well, they didn't do great, but as you can notice, there is a tail. There is a certain percent of patients that do respond to temozolomide. It has a pretty favorable side effect profile. Most people don't mind taking it. We kind of call it chemo light. And there are certain patients that do respond to it, and it's hard for us to predict who they are um, within the unmethylated group. So because of that, we give everybody temozolomide. 
even if you're MGMT methylated. And my sincere hope is that we do find a better treatment for patients who are unmethylated going forward, but that we can swap that Temidar out. But as of now, we're giving everybody um, temozolomide. Something that Dr. Bronstein had mentioned earlier that I want to touch on, I think is very familiar with people in the United States, but may not be in other countries, is the use of alternating electric fields. This is actually an FDA-approved therapy for newly diagnosed and recurrent glioblastoma, which uses a completely different way of treating tumors. It uses electric fields um, through electrodes that are placed on someone's skull. You have to shave your head and you wear four pads of electrodes on your head. And if you wear it 18 hours a day, this can disrupt how the spindle cells form during cell division and actually disrupt cell structure and prevent cell division. And studies have shown that this actually improves overall survival for patients if they wear it during adjuvant temozolomide on the order of four months. Furthermore, we actually saw a doubling of the five-year survival rate from Temidar only of 5% up to 13% in patients who wore TTF. So certainly this is a, um, a very viable treatment options for patients adding this to their Temidar or Temozolomide um, after their radiation therapy. And then we're also doing studies like Dr. Fonsi mentioned, moving that forward. Real. Valencia, that's it really. I don't, know um, I don't know who's, hey Nick, can you mute? Um, okay, so what about adding things to Temidar? Um, there was a recent study, the NOAA 09 trial that looked, it was a phase three, that looked at adding CCMU to temozolomide uh, compared to the standard therapy with temozolomide alone, specifically in MGMT methylated patients. So standard to do protocol, one-to-one -one randomization to the other group having Temidar dose reduced plus CCMU and radiation. What they found was a slight improvement um, in their modified intention to treat population with a significance of 0 0.049. Um, and in their intention to treat population 0 0.043, uh, a very small benefit to patients getting CCMU and temozolomide together for newly diagnosed patients. However, there was also a significant increase in toxicity, both myelosuppression and fatigue. So taking this into consideration and the fact that CCMU has a lifetime maximum, uh, before you start to have to worry about things like pulmonary and cardiac toxicity. Uh, we actually have not changed our practice to use TCMU upfront with Temidar, and instead holding on to that for patients at recurrence, allowing for another treatment option for them at that time. So it is a treatment option, but really hasn't changed our practice at UCSF at this moment. What about anti-angiogenic strategies? So uh, bevacizumab has had a lot of press and a lot of excitement. VEGF is clearly very important uh, for tumor vasculature. It helps um, blocking VEGF could, you know, disrupt the microvessels, regress normal microvessels, maybe normalize our vasculature to improve our chemotherapy deliverance uh, and inhibit new vessel formation. So there was some thought of potentially adding it to our newly diagnosed patients with standard of care and two very large trials, RTOG0825 and Avaglio looked at this exact question. Uh, looking at patients with radiation temidar placebo versus radiation temidar plus bevacizumab, really with patients throughout the world. They both looked at overall survival and progressive free survival as their primary outcomes. And the punchline is, is that the addition of bevacizumab did not improve overall survival. It did have some improvement in PFS, but not overall survival. So we don't actually, as a standard, add bevacizumab to our patients in the newly diagnosed setting. However, it is a great drug and we do use it. And I think all neuro-oncologists are really familiar with the phenomenon of pseudoprogression. So it's so common that I even tell my patients before radiation is, is started that your scan might look worse after. We don't panic. Many, many, many patients have this inflammatory response after radiation where they have great surgeries, we radiate them, all of a sudden there's more nodular enhancement, there's increase in T2 flare, and we're sitting there stumped. Did the tumor grow back or really is this treatment effect? But if you kind of ride it out, almost a half of patients will stabilize on their own and it will get better. So this is the phenomenon of pseudoprogression. Well, how do we make that happen faster? How do we make that go away? Well, the truth is we use bevacizumab to treat radiation necrosis and treatment effects. And we do it in a pulse dose way at UCSF. So we actually will give maybe one or two doses of bevacizumab to patients where we feel there's a good high chance of radiation effects. So this is one of my recent patients that just happened a few weeks ago, where um, the patient had a wonderful surgery, went through radiation after radiation, had significant increase in enhancement in T2 flare, was very symptomatic, was completely aphasic. 
we decided to give just one dose of bevacizumab at 10 milligrams per kilogram. One month later, had all calmed down. He was able to speak again. We're able to continue on with treatment with Temidar, you know, without thinking that he truly had tumor progression, but really these were treatment effects. All right, well, what about recurrence? This is really an individual treatment decision. Almost every patient will ask, Doc, what are we gonna do if the tumor comes back? And I have to tell them, honestly, I don't know yet because I don't know how, when, why, or if this tumor is gonna grow. And it really depends on that. Are we gonna do more surgery? Is it in a location that's outside of the radiation field that I can radiate again? Or um, is it within the radiation field? It's been two years. Can we do gamma knife, cyber knife? Is it time to go back on Temidar, switch to CCMU? Is it Optune? Or really, do we have a clinical trial option for you? So there are a few FDA-approved treatments for recurrent glioblastoma. The first is CCNU or lomistine, which is a nitrosuria or an alkylating agent, a very well-tolerated oral chemotherapy. Bevacizumab is actually a, approved from the FDA as a single agent. However, in practice, we usually do combine it with a cytotoxic drug like CCNU or carboplatin. And also Optune is a uh, FDA-approved device for recurrent GBM based on a non-inferiority trial looking at option compared to standard chemotherapies. So what do we do in practice? Uh, so at UCSF, we kind of go by the BLOB clinical trial, which was a randomized phase two trial looking at bevacizumab in combination with CCNU compared to sole agent. Uh, and the primary study outcome was nine months. And what they found was that the overall survival at nine months was significantly improved in the combination of bevacizumab and CCNU together. So definitely a great option. However, EORTC 26101 was a randomized phase three trial looking at the combination of CCNU compared to CCNU plus bevacizumab. They actually didn't see an overall benefit of the combination versus CCNU. So what do we actually do? So what I can say is if a patient has a recurrence, it's small, they're not necessarily symptomatic, it's not multifactorial, most of the time, we're gonna give CCNU at 110 milligrams per meter squared. However, if the patient is symptomatic, there's a lot of edema, maybe it's multifocal disease, then we're more likely to do the combination of CCNU and bevacizumab together. And in that setting, we do dose reduce the CCNU to 90 milligrams per meter squared. So in summary, bread and butter standard of care of high, of high grade gliomas, the STU protocol, can't forget it, uh, concurrent and adjuvant temozolomide, we always talk to our patients about Optune therapy. And if there's a significant pseudoprogression, we have a tendency to give pulse dose, dosing of Avastin or Bevacizumab. And then for standard of care at, of recurrent tumors, it really is individual surgery, radiation, chemo, you name it. Um, but for the chemotherapy options, either Temidar Rechallenge, CCNU plus or minus Bevacizumab or Optune therapy. And then finally, sometimes we also use Carboplatin. So with that, I'd love to thank my group of neuro-oncologists that I work with here at UCSF. Uh, you make it why, one of the reasons why I love coming to work every day. Thanks, guys.